first film in the series of Price of Kings, but the second one in this series in the order that one voice showed them, because uh, towards the end of January we showed um, the film on Shimon Perez, um, which is obviously a look at another sort of totemic leader in this conflict, but um, with a very different background. I want to quickly introduce our panel. Um, and because the room is relatively small this evening, there should be a good opportunity for a fairly informal uh, conversation and a fair bit of back and forth. And I hope that the film sort of inspired a couple of questions. Um, we've got some opinions I want to share. Uh, the first person I'd like to introduce, we're very lucky to have with us here this evening. Uh, to my left is uh, Ambassador Professor Manuel Hassassian. Um, professor Hassassian is uh, the Palestinian Ambassador of the United Kingdom. He was a Professor of Political Science at Bethlehem University for 25 years and has been President of the Palestinian European American Cooperation and Education Program. Uh, he received his doctorate uh, from the University of Reims in France in 1996 and he's also served as a consultant to the Higher Ministerial Committee for Church Affairs, the Ministry for Planning and International Cooperation, UNESCO and the Palestinian Negotiating Team on Refugee Final Settlement, amongst other issues. Uh, we're very glad to have you here with us tonight. Uh, to my right <coughs> is another professor, Professor Alan Johnson from BICOM. Uh, Alan is the editor of Fathom uh, for a deeper understanding of Israel and the region, a free quarterly journal app and a website, which is going to plug here to my right. And if you have an iPad, actually, it's a very, very nice application to download with uh, monthly or quarterly content. Um, he was a professor of democratic theory and practice at Edge Hill University before joining Bicom in 2011. Uh, a senior research fellow at the Foreign Policy Center, he founded and edited Dem Democratia, a free online journal of international politics from 2005 until its incorporation into Dissent magazine in 2009, where he serves now on the editorial board. Uh, he was also the co-author in 2006 of the Houston Manifesto, a modern statement on social democratic anti-totalitarianism, and he blogs weekly at the Daily Tower of the Telegraph uh, World Affairs. Um, and then lastly, uh, over on the far left there, is Richard Simons, who is the co-director of uh, the Price of King series of the film we saw this evening. Uh, replacing, at late notice, the other co-director, Joanna Natasagara, who, um, who couldn't be with us tonight because she's to fly to Geneva very early tomorrow. Uh, Richard is the founder as well as the director and producer at Spirit Level Film. And before coordinating The Price of Kings, uh, he co-directed and produced The Fear Factory, which is an expose of the UK's criminal justice system uh, and was screened in the Home Office, the Welsh Assembly, Scotland Yard, and actually went on to inspire a coalition of 60 organisations uh, to lobby for more effective policies in that realm. Um, so I'm going to take sort of the, the liberty of asking the first couple of questions and we'll obviously open it up to, to the floor. Um, and the first question I'd like to ask is, is to the ambassador. One voice, obviously, <clears throat> we do a lot of work in leadership and we try and train people in the, the sort of practical skills around uh, leading communities in such a difficult situation as the ongoing occupation and conflict. Um, the question I have is, is about Yasser Arafat as a leader and the division between him as a political leader who makes mistakes, who overreaches, who disappoints his people, and the leader sort of that Hussam Zomot uh, referred to, where there's a picture of him in every home and office uh, in the occupied territories where he's a real symbol, Abu Amar, I mean, the, the father of the nation. Does that present a, a conflict for people to be able to analyze him objectively between this person who's totemic in Palestinian history and society and someone who's also a flawed character in the history of the Palestinian people? Well, actually, if you trace the history of Arafat, you could say that he epitomized the concept of oxymoron. He was a leader that had all the contradictions that you could think of. I was not really a fan of Arafat, I have to admit that, although my respect to him goes beyond, you know, expressions. And I was always a sharp critic of Arafat, to the point that he managed to co-op me to give his speech in Geneva. But I tell you that Arafat symbolized the Palestinian national movement. And Arafat's main contribution with all the calamities that befell the Palestinians of poor leadership, of lack of judgment, is that he managed to create a Palestinian national identity. And that in itself, I think, could go into the annals of history, not as a president, but as a leader. And we call him Zayn. And there is a difference between an elected president and a Zayn who has a charismatic character. Mm -hmm. Arafat was a charisma, whether we like it or not. He made terrible mistakes, terrible decisions, 
But in the final analysis, we cannot really question his loyalty to the Palestinian people and to the cause of Palestine. And since he became the chairman in 1968 of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, I must say that he put the Palestinian back on the political map of world politics. But it's almost his greatest success was the first thing that he did, and then in the, the period afterwards, I mean, is the, the clarity and honesty that you're displaying there, is that something that you'll find very frequently in the political debate in the occupied territories? Right? Well, actually, I tell you, Arafat, with all his faults, with all his shortcomings, he is, he is a legend, a hero. You know, we cannot, we cannot compare, and it is so unfair to compare our president today with Yasser Arafat. Regardless that Abu Mazen was part and parcel of the Fatah movement, but you cannot compare, really, you know, our mm -hmm. president today with Yasser Arafat. And Yasser Arafat, he could really, uh, I mean, he was so impressive that he could wear the hat of a statesman and the hat of a freedom fighter. And you could never detect exactly how he can switch these roles, you know, and try to impress, you know, people to the point where nobody could figure him out. Mm -hmm. He is a case in psychology, I mean, it would be very hard really to analyze him. And who are we to sit? basically, and try to understand this man, who for him, you know, Palestine was everything. Mm. That's interesting to see someone in the public eye for so long, he still is a little bit of an enigma. Um, Professor Johnson, in as much as there's kind of a duality in the way that um, Palestinians, and sort of pro-Palestinian community, see Yasser Arafat, it might be sort of a similar situation. In Israel, I mean, when I speak to Israelis, particularly Israelis of a certain generation, the whole Arafat, in uh, sort of like the level of loathing that no other Palestinian leader ever had, um, as a symbol, I think, as much as a symbol for Palestinians, as a symbol for Israelis. Do you think that actually Israelis would be better off with Yasser Arafat as a leader, and what he was able to do to unite factions and to be able to hold a ceasefire and ultimately go to the negotiating table and hold a position? Um, the short one, but answer is no. Um, but I think the much more interesting answer was, maybe people missed it, it was very early in the film, and uh, it was Shimon Peres, something Shimon Peres said, which I think was more or less where I think many Israelis would be, which would be, Peres said, without him we couldn't start, with him we couldn't finish. Mm -hmm. And I think that combination of attitudes is, is really important. Um, one of the powerful things of the film, I thought, was, it's not a great moment in the peace process and hasn't been for some years. There's stasis in the process. I speak as a two-stater. Um, but the film reminded us of how far we've come in a lot of ways. I mean, Paris talked about the days when it was illegal to speak to the PLO when neither side really recognized each other's right to exist. There was certainly no contacts and negotiations. And, and the film took us through a process, even though it hasn't landed and we're in, in the midst of trying to, to return to, to where we were, certainly at Annapolis. Um, where we've made <coughs> tremendous progress. We should remember that you know, three years' worth of negotiations took place as recently as 2007-8. Um, gaps were narrowed, positions were laid out, um, the two sides built up some level of trust. That's not where we're at now, I'm not trying to say we are, but it reminds us that it's not that long ago that we, come, we came so much of the way towards a, a solution. I, I, I would agree that it, Arafat did more than anyone to champion and advance the Palestinian cause. I think the film was really, really about that, and it was very powerful in its depiction of that. If all nations are invented traditions, um, then no one did more to invent the Palestinian nation and to instill Palestinian identity, which the world recognizes now, than, than Yasser Arafat. However, I would say that there's a series of qualities that he embodied which unless the Palestinian national movement moves, transcends them, transcends the moment in which they were dominant qualities of the national movement, then um, statehood won't be achieved. I mean, it could be argued that Palestine would now be celebrating its 12th, 13th year of statehood if Arafat had acted differently at Camp David. I understand it's a very complicated debate. It rages about responsibility at Camp David. There's no simple story to tell. Um, but I think there's certain qualities, and they came through in the film, autocracy, a personalism, a rule, uh, a, a kind of attitude towards a mass movement or civil society or civil institutions, which is not, is not the new politics, it's, the, it's an old politics and it's not really going to work today. Corruption was mentioned as another one. Um, a culture of hate, 
I would say, um, again, not perhaps in Arafat himself, but in terms of the, the flourishing of a, of a certain discourse and text and popular culture. It could be argued as well, and these are many things that the international community and Israel rightly called out the, the first years of the Palestinian Authority over, and then the rule of President Abbas, Abu Mazen since, and we've seen drastic reduction of incitement and improvement of corruption, uh, complete uh, rejection of violence in Abu Mazen during the Second Intifada was critical of Arafat himself uh, and the conduct. Yet, with those changes in Palestinian political culture, settlement activity continues and fruitful negotiations didn't take place. Yeah. We have an, the journal I edit found, we have an article in by Hussein Ibish in this issue. Hussein is someone who works on the Palestinian task force in, in DC. And one of the things he argues there, which I think is, is true, and I would agree with, is that if you look at the two sides of the Palestinian national movement in the last 18 months or so, and you ask who, who seems to have been rewarded, and who seems to have not been rewarded, then the messaging seems to have been that uh, Hamas's path of resistance, at least they can tell a narrative that they've been rewarded more than Abbas's and Fayyad's path. So there's a failure of Israeli political culture reinforcing the failure of Palestinian political culture. I, I, I mean, I, I'm speaking more personally now, perhaps, I think one of the great failures has been the failure to support Fayyad and Fayyadism. I think it was a, a significant turn to state building away from the kind of abs that Hanan Ashra was talking about, away from the absence of rule or to rule of law, away from a personalism to institution building, away from corruption to transparency. It, to me, there was, it was win, win, win. And I think my view is that Israel woke up relatively recently <coughs> to its failure to fully back a Fayyad. I think the Arab states who aren't delivering money to Fayyad are also to blame. And I think there's some resentments within Palestinian national movement towards Fayyad which reflect possibly some of those old relationships of corruption and uh, fiefdoms and so on that, that Hannah Ashraba was referring to. So there's, there's, there's blame enough to go around, for sure. Um, a bit of a conflict. Um, Richard, one thing that strikes me watching this and a couple of weeks ago watching the, the film of Shimon Perez, um, will be that the, the Israeli um, interviewees speaking about President Perez seem to be much sort of free flowing, more, more free flowing in their criticism of mm -hmm. his leadership than it seemed to be the case for the Palestinians. I think uh, Professor Sassi on the side, uh, I have seen very few Palestinians in public criticize um, his rule, but in private I've heard quite a lot of criticism. Yeah. Did you find trying to make a film that that was a challenge and trying to get sort of the full nuance of the individual across? Um, yes. <laughs> It, um, you know, uh, people would, would freely admit that they love the man, um, and in fact, uh, uh, Ashrawi said as much as well. Yeah. He said she, she loved the guy, but um, acknowledged his, his flaws. Um, yeah, very, very few people. In fact, that one of the regrets in the film is that, uh, well, I have in making the film is that we. No one would speak on camera about the sort of human rights abuses that, that led towards the um, second intifada. Mm -hmm. you know, part, part of there was obviously there was corruption. He didn't really make an effective transition to a national leader. He was clearly a brilliant revolutionary, not a very good um, head of a fledgling state, and. I think, I think the legacy of that is, is a weak leadership, um, the fiefdoms that uh, Alan mentioned. Um, and unfortunately, well, Hamas taking over in Gaza, all those sort of things came together. Uh, and I guess it's that that's part and parcel of the lack of open criticism uh, for Arafat. Mm -hmm. Time. It was very much of its time. I suppose it's much easier in hindsight to criticise the guy, especially when he's dead. Having said that, you know, he was an extraordinary leader. Uh, it might not be fair, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. If you're, if you're setting up the two leaderships, I mean, the consensus on our panel last time round was quite critical of Shimon Peres. Yeah. And, and again, it was a failure to grasp the metal, maybe a failure to be able to drive home what many thought were perhaps a bit charitable as positions, or, or to be a brave leader. Yeah. Um, 
without sort of going into much more depth comparatively between the, both, the, the two, but that sort of willingness to face down uh, extremists or, or contraries in our own community, to be brave, to grasp the metal. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, but I think what we, we learned um, filming across the first three films mm. is that you can't really, the only person who can make those calls is the leader themselves. They're the only people who have the vision and, and the, either the confidence or lack of confidence to ride the dragon of an intifada or suppress it. They, they're, they're the only people who, who can make those calls. Um, and also, it's not strictly fair to compare them because Perez, Perez had the benefit of the 70 year struggle that the Zionist movement had beforehand. And he, he sort of came into a position of power in, in the early 50s, um, or, or was central in government from, from that point onwards, and was a very good administrator, very good stakeholder. Um, so if you put Perez in the position of a revolutionary leader, having to handle the 70 years that, that led to 1948 and uh, the independent state of Israel, you know, so I suspect he would not have been, he certainly didn't have the charisma of Arafat, um, uh, or, or the determination of someone like a guru. Um, and Arafat, Arafat had never made that transition to being a great leader of a, a fledgling state. So um, Perez was clearly very, very good as a second in command at the administrative. So the short answer to your question is, I don't think you can compare the two. Um, I don't think you can. They're both, uh, I think across the series, what we try to do is, is humanize the notion of leadership and, and try and really bring to the fore the, the issues and the difficulties that people have in leadership. Um, and and both, of those, both of those guys face considerable adversity. Um, with different measures of success. Absolutely. Um, okay, so we can open it up again because the, the numbers are relatively slight, so people should feel free to stick their hands up. Um, the microphone can take some moment to I didn't think we'd need it. Can you be heard? Is, is, is there a need yeah, for yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It seems okay. a bit quite similar level. All right. Um, so, anyone like to ask the first question? Just switch it on the note. <coughs> no questions. Can we make comment on what we have heard? Absolutely, yeah, please do. Uh, I mean, actually, I was uh, I was responding to your question, mm. but uh, it seems that Adam went uh, a little bit further, started to discuss Abomazim, Fayyadism, uh, corruption, and the failure of the national movement and the negotiations and what that. So let's open uh, the discussion okay. at all fronts, and Free let's not be confined only to discuss about the history of one man sure. who was, you know, considered to be a national hero for the Palestinians, regardless of his faults. If we look at Arafat today and try to assess what he has accomplished, first of all, comparing Arafat to Paris, with all respect, is comparing apples with oranges. You cannot put these two leaders in, in that category to make comparisons. I think I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Paris, Paris so could be... Let me throw that respect. Yeah. Right back. Uh, Paris himself could be discussed as a leader of the Israeli people and how he managed through diplomacy and what have you to become a political leader with high stature that has been respected. Yeah. But to put them in a comparative perspective, I, I think you know it's unfair to do that. The other point which I'm trying to make here is very, very clear. As I said, Arafat was the maestro of tactics. Arafat was the father and the author of how to control factions. Sorry, Professor, when you say the maestro of tactics. Yes. He did not have the grand design and the vision mm. because he fluctuated from the liberation of all Palestine to the liberation of the 1967 borders, and he was not really focused exactly whether he wants to coexist with Israel or he wants to drive the Israelis into the sea. Okay? Let's let's be here. Here we are frank, mm. and and we in order to be, I, I'm not going to speak as an ambassador as much as a scholar on this issue, 
because really it hurts me sometimes when we try, you know, to distort the perceptions without being really true. I'm not a propagandist, and I'm not a pro arafatist neither I'm a pro Abu Mazen, all right? I'm an ambassador who represents the Palestinian people and their quest for independence. I'm here to fight for their cause. I'm here to raise the awareness of the British public about, you know, a people that has been suffering for the last 62 years under occupation, which is a heinous crime that has been continuing under the bastion of democracy without reaching, you know, anywhere, even when we have opted to go through negotiations. And let me just forget about the era of Arafat and talk about the era of Abu Mazen. Okay. Since Abu Mazen came to power, he made it very clear. He said, oh, my strategy is negotiations. And my strategy is basically to achieve an independent Palestinian state on the 1967 borders. And my strategy is not to use violence. And my strategy, I'm willing to negotiate, and I'm willing to go ahead with the international community, and I'm willing to make the historic painful compromises of accepting a state on only 22% of Palestine. And we were the ones who had really committed ourselves to the first phase of the roadmap, which was, I mean, imposed on us by President Bush in 2004. They said, build infrastructure development and security. Mm -hmm. We have done that. What was the Israelis position then that were asked to stop settlements? And rightly so, you said it. What was the reward that the Palestinians had to go into the peace process except to see more settlements, more settlers? And today, the problem is no more the Palestinian right of return as much as the basic condition just to go back to the negotiating table, to re-engage, is just to put a moratorium on the building of settlements. So, so, Professor Johnson, on that, I mean, to the ambassador's point, if Palestinian political culture from Arafat comparatively before to Abu Mazen has been moderating the entire time under intense pressure internationally and from Israel, it could be argued, as the ambassador has done so, that Israeli political culture has shifted the opposite direction, moving the goalposts the whole time and making sort of the compromises necessary today insufficient tomorrow. Um, it's a bit of a myth about Israeli culture, political culture moving to the right, um, by any realistic measure, it's, it's, it's moved significantly to the left. Um, again, if you think about the early parts of the film and um, Shamir and so on, this is talking about, and compare what Shamir was saying there to Netanyahu's bar land speech in which he accepted the two-state solution. Um, Netanyahu settlement freeze for 10 months, however we think that was inadequate or the failure to take it up from the other side. Nonetheless, both of those things put him far away from the greater Israel project of the 70s and the early Likud years. That's a significant shift. Um, the, the annexationists currently in Israel are a minority and they did not... They're a minority, they're going to be in the Israeli government in the next few weeks. Well, they did not do well the election. I was in Israel for the election and the real story of the election was what didn't happen. There was a prediction in the Western media that Israel is going to the dogs, it's all going off to the right, the religious people, the extremists are taking over, the peace process is finished. Actually, that's not what happened. In the middle of the day, on the day itself of the Israeli election, panic began inside the Makhud, is what happened. And Netanyahu took to Facebook, and some of the leaders took to Facebook and other places to say, Makhud next, put down whatever you're doing. That's actually what they said. Put down whatever you're doing and go out to vote. But there was a panic, and we could pick it up. We were picking up all sorts of issues that that paper was, was rising. <coughs> Meretz is the left-wing Zionist party had doubled its vote. I spoke to a very excited Meretz new MK at about 2 o'clock in the morning who thought maybe there'd be a centre-left government, which was never quite going to happen, but you could understand her excitement at that moment. That, that, the little, the little pig party that we went to was euphoric. Um, this is a centre, it's a centre-left. Now, I'm not saying on the peace process, he, 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 he ran on the peace process, he didn't, mm -hmm. he ran on domestic issues. Yes. But nonetheless, if you read the speech that Lapid gave in Ariel, now he gave it in Ariel, that's, that's interesting. Also but, controversial. But what he, said, what he said was also interesting, which is that you know, he would only end up the government if serious moves were made towards peace, that this was not a problem I'm willing to hand on to my children and grandchildren. Livni has been brought into the government. I think this is significant. I don't think it's just part and parcel of you know, coalition negotiations and she's going to be sidelined. Netanyahu has brought Livni into the government, and he's, at this point at least, things can change in the coalition haggling, but at this point at least she's going to be in charge of negotiations with the Palestinians with a brief 
to reach a settlement. Now, whatever we, th we think of the chances of that, she, she has a track record with that will allow us serious negotiations for a long period of time. She's essentially come back into politics to, to do this thing. So that, again, it may, it may not get us all the way there, but it's some way from the predictions of a Natalie Bennett, Netanyahu, leading the government. Uh, so in that sense, in the immediate short-term sense, it was a, a move to the centre-left. You just need to look at the balances of the, of the numbers in the Knesset. Um, and in the longer term sense of where we were, say, in the 70s, to where, where the political culture is now, with the widespread acceptance of the two-state solution, um, that's a significant move. I mean, I, I just say a couple of other sure. things briefly. Um, one of the people who we worked with at Bicom was Tal Becker. Tal Becker was one of the main negotiators for the Israeli side at Annapolis. And Tal says something which I think is just worth saying how difficult it is to reach these conclusions. And Tal used to say there's kind of six things going on at once. I mean, there's, there's two sides of the room. On your side of the room, you have to have enough agreement with everyone else on your side of the table. Then your side of the table has to have enough agreement with the people on the other side of the table. And then both sides of the table have to have enough agreement going backwards to the, the, the people back home that they would avoid as other constituencies and so on. And one of the things he said was, it, it, that's difficult enough in and of itself to find the right alignment of the stars, so to speak, so that, so that all the six things are aligned. But also it's a question of, can you write the other side's victory speech? You used to have that impression. Can, can you write the other side's victory speech? Can you, can you reach out in your mind to what the other side need um, to make a success? I think there's two interesting things at the moment where, where we're at. One is, I think challenges for both sides. The challenge for the Palestinian side, I think, is can they make this about the 67 file? And I know this is controversial, and it's not a case to say that we don't say anything about the 48 file, but can the question of the right of return be managed in negotiations in such a way that means what's left at the end of the day is a, is a Jewish majority state, and what's left is a Palestinian national movement that feels its experience in 48 has been recognized, that there's been humanitarian returns of people, that there are programs, for instance, which uh, President Abbas talked about recently of visits and so on to, to villages where he grew up, but nonetheless it's, it's part and parcel of the solution. I, I think as long as, I think the international global solidarity movement plays a negative role here, as long as it's about full, untrammeled, absolute right of return, then negotiations are very, very hard to see how negotiations can succeed. On the Israeli side, I think it's, the thing that worries me most is not so much the, the settlements, because I think the blocks take up some 80% of the settlers. The blocks have been part of any serious end of settlement negotiations. It's possible to have land swaps, which take in the major settlement blocks, one-to-one -one compensations of land growth for Palestinians, and as for the hilltop people and the crazies and the youth and the taggers, they can take care of themselves and will be taken care of. Um, that, to me, is not just the issue of Jerusalem. I think the Palestinians have been asked to make one historic compromise in terms of 22% of, of the land, the mandate of Palestine, another historic compromise in terms of right of return. I actually think to, to expect the Palestinians to make a third historic compromise in that of the capital in East Jerusalem is a historic compromise too far. And one of the concerns about some of the, the, the building projects, for me, is much more, much less to do with somebody builds uh, an extra kindergarten in um, a settlement as, as Jerusalem. Just on that point, just quickly, because I want to um, put that back to, to the ambassador. We had criticism from Israeli and Palestinian speakers in the film about Arafat's decision to go to the 67 borders, I mean to Professor Johnson's point about the 48 versus 67 files, to go to the 67 borders as being the first position, the first compromise, so that there was, I think to quote one of the speakers, no fallback position. Um, do you think that that has made the political culture in Palestine quite difficult, I mean to, to the Professor's point about directly confronting the issue of refugees, being able to speak about compromises might be necessary because of the gap between where the public is and where the leadership went very fast. I want to be a practitioner and not a theoretician. Okay. I want to share with you my personal experience in 52 second trash negotiations with Israelis. So I'm sharing with you something, not something theoretical, but something that I felt it when I was negotiating with the Israeli side. Look, the six issues that we refer to as permanent status issues are all important issues. And we cannot say one issue is more important than the other. It's like a Catholic marriage organically interrelated while there is no divorce. And that's why one of the basic failures of this peace process is that we have succumbed to the idea of incrementalism. Incrementalism was a recipe for disaster. 
Because if we wanted to look at, at, at the issues stage by stage, we were stuck in the second redeployment. Mm -hmm. And what we have seen, more building of settlements, sectors of Israel, we have managed to get every single issue that is considered to be outstanding, we managed to get a negotiated settlement. And I tell you, it's all there in the Muqata'a, and it's all there in the Prime Minister's office. But the problem here is that, you know, our leadership may be both sides, and I don't want to be biased against the Israelis, although, you know, I don't trust this Netanyahu, all right? With all respect, they're not ready to make peace because they lack the political will. Mm -hmm. And this is the culture that you were talking about. The culture of peace was not, never inculcated in the Oslo peace process. As a matter of fact, Israel was jockeying to build more settlements because they thought that this peace process would give them, you know, the time to go ahead and continue the building of settlements, which, which is, you know, the, the accomplishment of the Messianic dream of Eretz Israel. And, and to come and tell me that, you know, these elections, you know, has shifted from right to center to left, in the final analysis, my dear friend, the Zionist ideology reigns still supreme in the public of the Israelis who have, in the past, elected, you know, extreme leaders, conservative leaders, leaders who are not willing to make the historic compromise. And here where I have to make my comment. I think I, regardless of Arafat being, you know, a slick, and he managed to play, you know, the international politics, and he was never corrupt, but he was a corrupter. And with all the faults of Fatih and what have you and the authority, one thing we have really to admit here is the fact that when Abu Mazen made his pledge that we want, would like to have a Palestinian state, and that state should be on the borders of 1967, believe me, he meant it. You know, today the situation in the West Bank, on the political level, we're passing through a stage of Proudhon, what he says, anarchy. Because we cannot envision what will be the policies of the Israelis on the other side. And because of that, this uncertainty, mm -hmm. the, uncertainty the political uncertainty, makes us even more skeptical I mean, you can say that that's a mirror image. I mean, many Israelis will look at the leadership of Hamas in Gaza yes, and, and they will say the same thing. I'm coming to that. Uh, there is a, one consensus here, which is very important, between Hamas, Fatih, and all the Palestinian uh, factions. End of occupation. The rest is academic, my friend. To come to grips, you know what is the problem between in the Musalah and the reconciliation? is whether we are going to use proportional representation or are we going to use, you know, uh, uh, these are the things that Fatih and Hamas are, are discussing. They're not discussing the issue of the peace process. Because Hamas also understands that at the end of the day, Amsterdam is not going to pave the way for the independence of Palestine. They know it. I think the residents of Southern Israel that might sort of think slightly differently. But regardless, I think I saw some hands going up there. So, to questions for yes? So, okay. Um, yeah, I was just commenting generally. I mean, uh, several polls show consistently that you know, the majority of Israel, <coughs> the majority of Palestinians believe in a two-state solution based more or less on the 67 borders. And everyone knows more or less what that solution will look like. So I find it kind of depressing that you know, everyone knows what the solution is, but it never happens. And I think, I guess one of the reasons is that the general publics of both sides don't trust each other. So while, for example, the Israelis say we believe in two-state solution, we don't think that the Palestinians believe that, that we think almost Palestinians want to take over the whole land. And well, the Palestinians will say, well, actually, Israelis look at the building the settlements, so they don't actually believe in two-state solution either. So um, I think both sides have pretty good legitimate reasons to distrust the other in a way. I mean, like, I guess the Israeli narrative is, okay, there's also a flawed narrative, but they would say, look, okay, we pulled out God, we've got rockets, and therefore they don't want to make peace. And then the Palestinians would understand to say, well, look, they're just building settlements, so how can you say you believe in that? Two state solution. So, um, I guess my question is maybe for, the, for the ambassador or, or Mr. Professor Johnson is um, to what extent do you think both publics are responsible for that lack of trust um, on the other side? So. Let me very briefly add, you want to say something? Well, uh, yeah. yeah, I think there's two distinct problems uh, on each side. With Israel, you've got a lack of political will at the very top. But 
I think recent events have uh, certainly been an action that we'll see how that pans out, that might change. And on the Palestinian side, you've got a problem with political capital. The leadership just doesn't have the political capital of the people. Um, it's quite, I think, a vast, uh, well, the fight that he never got support that he, he was due. Um, and there's a whole, in, in fact, Hassan, the, the leadership that we came across, there were two distinct levels, sort of 60 plus year olds, and then, and then this sort of level of guys who are, um, I, I want to say, 35 to 45. And they're trying to break through, and I think they could do a fantastic job of it. But I think the old guard is a problem. Maybe you should be the Israeli side. No, I'm talking about Hamas. Oh, sorry. Um, and, and the lack of political capital of the current leadership. The old guard in, in the Palestinian town, they, they just can't pull their people together. Um, and conversely, with Israel, you've got a lack of political willpower. However, that, I think in the current elections, you've seen that that might change a little bit. We'll see, we'll see how that comes out. Yeah. Livingston, I hope Livingston is an important appointment. She's Minister of Justice as well. Yeah, and that's, I, I don't know about you, Anne, but I've always thought that. Judiciary in Israel have been the last hope. They're the guys who sort of pull the uh, the right wing back when they need to. They're, they're the guys who say, "Sorry, that's a go and do it." Um, so I think Livni, in that particular appointment, with a mandate um, to prosecute a peace process, could be quite a powerful combination. Uh, so you know, there's some light in the tunnel. There may be a fair bit of pain. Yeah. But there's some light there.